Amen, amen. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. How are we doing today? Oh, fantastic. Matthew did such a good job getting you guys warmed up. I don't know why I'm up here. I should have just left Matthew up here to talk to you guys. Um, I just want to say before we get going into the, the message today that, that we, Casey and I, are so blessed because we've got um, a bunch of extra Americans here in the room. So, yeah, yeah. So you guys not only have to deal with my American accent, but if you hear someone talking and they sound a bit funny, uh, then they're friends of Casey and I. They actually come from the church uh, that, that, uh, that I came from and, and grew up in. So I'm, I trust you guys will be super nice to them and super friendly uh, to them. But yeah, it's just thankful to have them here. So uh, we are finishing up the series this week called Risky Business. And the reason that we're talking about things being risky is that life has risk associated with it. Life is hard. We all take a risk when we go throughout our week this week. But we've specifically been focusing on this idea that that is around, uh, are you a risk taker or are you a play it safer? And what we mean about this, and I introduced this to you about three weeks ago, is this idea of am I somebody that naturally takes a risk or am I somebody that naturally plays it safe? So everybody fits in one of those two categories. And in fact, everybody maybe has areas in their life where they are more of a risk taker and then areas where they're more of a play it safer. Now, on the other side of every risk that you take is the potential for a reward, right? And so the thing that motivates us to take a risk is if I take a risk, on the other side of this, I'm going to be rewarded with something that I think is valuable enough for me, and it motivates me to take this risk. So yesterday, we had an amazing spread at our house, and I normally try and eat healthy, and Casey picked up those wonderful cakes from Woolworths, the the carrot cake and the, the lemon cake, and I said, you know what, I'm risking not gaining weight. But the reward for eating this cake far enough outweighs any risk that I could take. And so, you know what? I, I ate the cake. The reward was worth it to me. But in, in, in your life, whether it's adventure or whether it's finances or whether it's business or regardless of whatever it is, you get the opportunity to take a risk and you also get the opportunity to decide, I'm going to play it safe. And oftentimes what determines whether or not our reward is worth it or not is this thing that we've been calling fear. And so there's things that you're afraid of so that will prevent you from taking the risk. So you may look at a risk and then you've got a reward on the other side of it, but you say, you know what? There's a fear there that's not worth it for me. I'm afraid of gaining weight, so I'm not going to eat the cake. I'm not going to take that risk and look for that that reward. And so what I thought that I would do today is I want to make this super practical for you. And it's not a very complicated message today, but sometimes the simplest messages with with the simplest verses are going to require you guys to take some of the biggest decisions that you have in your life. And we've spent the last three weeks watching people break through, watching people step into freedom, watching people move past fear, watching people accept themselves more than they've ever accepted themselves before. And I believe today that there's going to be more of that. I believe that today you're going to get an opportunity to step into freedom like you've never stepped into it before. But before we do that, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with fear. Now, a bit of a trigger warning for you guys. Uh, There's lots of fears that we have out there. And I went through looking for things, and I found some really, really tough stuff. And I'm going to put one up here for you now. Yeah. Yeah, can you guys feel that crawling on your neck? Yeah, I see people looking, you know, you feel the tickle under your shirt, you know. So if you're not afraid of spiders, and especially if you're not afraid of spiders that are carrying spiders, baby spiders with them, this to me is a burn it to the ground. If I find this in my house, I'm burning the whole house to the ground. So we're afraid of this. Uh, growing up, we, we grew up with the movie Indiana Jones. Anybody see Indiana Jones, Temple of Doom, when he has to reach through all the bugs to get to the... I just would have died. I would have laid down and said, I'm done. Life is over. There is no reward great enough for me to take a risk on something like this. In fact, when Casey and I lived in, in Nelspruit and in White River, I had a rule because there you have rain spiders, which are these, you know, yeah, we know. Yeah, we all know. And I had a rule. If that spider came down head height, it was a dead spider. 
So spiders are something that, that many of us are afraid of. Another thing that many of us are afraid of is a fear of heights. And so a lot of us have this thing called vertigo. A lot of us, we don't enjoy things that, that make us feel, you know, feel like we could fall off the edge. And so th- this limits so many people. I, you know, we have this team that's here with us, and we want to take them up on the cable car. And the first thing I ask is, is anybody afraid of heights? And I'll never forget that one morning I was watching a video. You know, I was laying in bed watching YouTube, as you all do. And I was laying there, and I found a video of a guy that was working on a cell phone tower. And he was climbing up this tower, and he had a GoPro on. And I realized about seven minutes into the video that I was sweating in bed because I was nervous for him as he climbed this tower. And so fears are like a real thing, and they really impact us. And I've got, I've got one more thing for you that they'll put on the, the screen here. And, and this last picture, this is not a fear. This is a palate cleanser. <laughs> so if I've made you afraid, or if, I've brought, if you've got spiders on your mind, or if you've got the fear of heights on your mind, I, this, this little puppy here is just to cleanse your thoughts, just to cleanse your palate, <laughs> give you something to look at and think about. You know, but, but the thing about fear is, is this. Fear is real. It's one of the most powerful emotions that we have. It's one of those emotions that controls us maybe more than any other emotion that's out there. We spend our entire lives trying to shelter ourselves so that we don't experience fear that we don't want to experience. We, we set up our lives in a way that prevents fear from being a part of our daily life. And the tricky thing about fear is that fear doesn't have to be rational. See, it's rational to be afraid of spiders. It's rational to be afraid of heights. But you know what? Some of the worst fears that we have, some of the biggest monsters within us and within our thoughts and our feelings are the irrational fears. Like, I'm terrified of being afraid. I'm afraid to be afraid. And that's something that's real. If anyone in here deals with anxiety or deals with panic attacks, you may find yourself so afraid of being afraid because being afraid will give you a panic attack that you send yourself into a spiral that is a panic attack. And nothing's even happened. You're just sitting on the couch thinking and your mind is rolling and running and all of a sudden you're just terrified. See, this thing about fear is that it has more control over your life than you know. So... In order for us to move on with the sermon, I want everybody to think about your fear. And I don't mean spiders, and I don't mean heights and things like that. I mean, what's the the irrational thing in you? Is it fear of new relationships? Is it fear of forgiveness? Is it fear that you'll never be forgiven? Is it fear of, of giving somebody grace because you're afraid that they'll hurt you? Is it the fear of believing in yourself? Is it the fear of stepping out on faith in a job? Is it is it a fear? That, that bottles you down and that dampens your personality. I want you to put that in your mind because at the end of the service, we're going to get an opportunity to do something with that. And there's a danger if we don't do something with that because what we do is we create, like I said, these safety boxes in our lives. And we have these, these safety boxes and these no-go zones. And so I may be super brave, and I may be willing to go rock climbing, and I may be willing to jump off a bridge into the water. I may just be, you know, an adventurous person and have no problems with that. But, you know, I can promise you that there's an area in my life that's a no-go zone. Maybe I've been hurt in a relationship before. And so what I say is, you know what, relationally, that's a safety box. I'm putting that situation in a box, and I'm, I'm boxing myself in. And we think it's a safety box, but actually what it is is it's a coffin. It's something that holds you prisoner. Our no-go zones are areas that prevent you from entering into new relationships. It prevents you from healing those broken relationships. Anybody have a broken relationship with a friend, especially with family? You know what? The, The world would love more than anything for you to never, ever, ever heal that relationship. And you've convinced yourself that you need this no-go zone. You convince yourself that I need to build a safety box around my life. And what that ends up doing is over time, we have subscribed to one of the biggest lies that we could ever adopt. And that lie is that if we risk nothing, we lose nothing. If we risk nothing, then we can lose nothing. This is where we think that we can play it safe. You know what? I took a risk on a relationship. And she broke my heart or he broke my heart or I got divorced, or I was hurt by this friend group. And so, you know what? It hurt 
to go through that. So now I'm no longer going to risk, I'm not going to risk a relationship. Because if I, don't risk, if I don't risk getting into a relationship, then there's nothing I can lose. There's nothing that I can be hurt for. So if I risk nothing, I lose nothing. But actually, this, this is a lie, guys. You lose everything when you risk nothing. Because what happens when you risk nothing is you begin to build regret. And if you think about your life as like a, a bank, you begin to build this huge bank account that's full of regret. And you start piling regret on regret on regret because as you risk nothing, you start to think, man, I regret that I didn't let healing happen in that relationship. I didn't let healing occur in my own life. I didn't let myself forgive myself. And you just start to build regret and regret and regret. And you know what? There's, there's a truth for you that I want, I want this to soak in. I want this to impact your life, and I want this to affect you. And that truth is that you will not regret the mistakes that you make as much as the opportunities that you don't take. Think about that. You will not regret the mistakes that you make as much as the opportunities that you don't take. Let's, let's stop building a bank account of regret. That's something we've spent the last three weeks talking about. Let's not look back on our life. In fact, let's not look back on last week. When we get to the end of this week, let's not look back and say, man, there's so many opportunities I didn't take. And you know what? Those are the things that I'm going to end up regretting the most. And so today we're going to talk about probably the biggest fear that has the most influence on all of us. This is the fear that probably influences more of your decisions than you know or you realize. This is a fear that influences what shoes you buy. It's a fear that influences what clothes you wear. It's a fear that influences what job you take, what car you drive. It's a fear that influences how you present yourself when you walk into a room. It's a fear that, that influences how confident you are in who you are or how unconfident you are in who you are. And this fear is something that, that we all deal with. No one is immune to it. Nobody gets to take a pass on today. And that fear is the fear of rejection. This fear of rejection, which the Bible talks about as the fear of man. So when you read in the Bible and you hear in a verse and it says the fear of man, it's talking about the fear of rejection, fear of being rejected by mankind, fear of being rejected by our friends and by our family. This is why we spend so much money on shoes and clothes. This is why when I got up this morning, I put on the outfit I put on because I think, man, I hope that the church accepts me for what I wear. I hope, I hope that my shoes look cool and we got all these young adults, you know, in the room. And we had, we had Smiley, our, our worship leader, had a, had a band gathering. Coming for you, Tracy. Had a band gathering. And all the young adults got together and I heard about it. And I said, hey, how come I didn't know that that was happening? <laughs> and, and Smiley says, because you're not invited. This is like a... It's like a young people thing. And I'm like, you know, what do you mean? I'm only 39. I can come to this thing. He says, no, Pastor Chris, this is a young adult thing. We're, you know, getting together. And I'm like, okay, fine. You don't want me there. I'm rejected. You know, I don't fit in. I'm not acceptable. And then I get to work the next week and I find out that Smiley invited, that's Tracy's laying down in the seat right now. There were other adults there. So it wasn't an age thing. You know, that's a, that's a funny example, but for some of you, you've had that real encounter that happened in your life that makes you like, oh man, am I not enough? Am I not worth enough? Am I not wearing the right clothes? Am I not driving the right car? Am I seeking, uh, am I seeking belonging in a group of friends or in a group of people because I don't want to go through this fear of rejection? I don't want to be rejected. You know, to, to feel rejected is so personal because when you're rejected, you are rejected. Not something that you've done, not something that you've caused, not something around you. It's you as a person at your core are rejected. That's why it hurts so much. That's why it impacts you so much. That's why this fear is a fear that is so hard to overcome. And it's so hard to, to let go of because it's you. It's, it's your core. It's who you think you are. It's what you think that you're made of. And so today I want to share a little bit of wisdom with you. And we're going to be talking about one verse. 
And this one verse is worthy enough for us to focus on because this one verse has such a simple truth in it. And that if we apply that truth to our lives, then that takes you one step closer to walking out of that fear of rejection and getting over that fear of man. So what we're going to be looking at today is a guy named King Solomon. So if you know your way around the Bible, King Solomon is a guy that wrote a lot of Proverbs. He's also a guy that wrote the Song of Solomon, which is not a book you want your 14-year-old to read. Some of you that are laughing have read it. The others are like, what's he talking about? Yeah, go read it. Go read it. So King Solomon is a guy, just to give you a little context about him, Solomon was David's son. This is King David, the famous King David, one of Israel's greatest kings. This is King David that had the bloodline that Jesus came from. And when David had, had Solomon, his son, at 15 years old, Solomon took on the throne. So he had to follow in these big shoes. He had these huge shoes that he had to fill. And at 15 years old, he takes over as king. And Solomon was also given this task. See, David before him had prayed. He, David had said, God, I want to build your temple. See, up until that point, there was no permanent home for God. There was no church like we have here. There's no permanent place for him. God was in a tent. They set up a tent, and God moved with the people. And there was the Ark of the Covenant, which, again, if you're curious about that, watch Indiana Jones. And so that's where the Spirit of God was, was in the Ark of the Covenant. And so... That, that moved around with the people. And David said, God, I want to build you a temple. I want to build a permanent place for you. And God basically said, no, 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 it's not in your time. And then when Solomon took over, at the age of 15, God tells Solomon, Solomon, I want you to build the temple. So now not only is Solomon filling the shoes of his dad, these huge shoes, Solomon also now is in charge of building this temple that generations of people have wanted to build for God. And so Solomon goes on in his life to prove to be one of the wisest people that, that ever came. He wrote some of the wisest things that we can read. He gave us some amazing advice. And where we pick up today is we pick up on a moment in Solomon's life where Solomon is reflecting. And so this is a guy that's been through it. He's dealt with fear. He's dealt with rejection. I mean, just imagine you have an amazing leader and you come up behind him and you just hope people like you. You hope people accept you. You hope that what you do is acceptable to the people. And so Solomon's reflecting on his life. And he writes some of what we read in Proverbs. And Solomon gets to a point in his life where he thinks to himself, and I like to imagine this, where Solomon begins to think about those hard days. He begins to think about those times that people said, you'll never build that temple. You'll never get that done. You'll never bring peace to the land. You'll never fill your dad's shoes. And he thinks about those moments. And when he thinks about those moments, with the wisdom and the ability to look back on his past, he gives us this verse. And he says this in Proverbs 29, 25. He says, The fear of man, the fear of rejection, brings a snare. Now Solomon could have said anything. Solomon could have, could have associated the fear of man with anything that he, that, that he wanted to or that he chose. So why did Solomon choose the word snare? What was it about that that made him think this is what applies to the fear of man, the fear of rejection? You know, what's unique about a snare? A snare is a trap. A snare is something that, that has something enticing on it to draw prey to it. The purpose of a snare is to catch you, is to capture you, or to capture an animal, or to catch an animal. But in order to catch that animal, there's got to be something, there's got to be a sweet treat on it. There's got to be something that that animal wants. There's got to be something that draws it in. There's got to be something that the animal thinks that it needs. And so a snare is something that's hidden. You don't know it's there. Because if an animal knew that a snare was there, then the animal would not take the bait or would not step on it. The animal would then avoid it or stay away from it. But a well-placed snare can fool and trick an animal. The other unique thing about a snare is that a snare is not designed to capture the whole body of an animal. What is a snare usually designed to capture? A small piece, a foot, a tail, an arm, a toe, something small. But you know what happens? When a snare catch, catches the smallest part of the animal, it gets the whole body. 
And so when Solomon is associating the fear of man with a snare, I think there's so much intentionality in what he's saying. And he's saying that, that if you need to be accepted by man, if you are so afraid of being rejected by man, it is a snare for your life. You are walking into a well-hidden trap. And when you let rejection have, have, have authority over your life, then what you end up doing is you say, you know what, in this situation, I'm just going to not be exactly who I am because I'm afraid that if I am who I am, I'm going to get rejected by this group of friends or I'm going to experience rejection at work. Or you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to experience rejection from my spouse at home. You know, maybe you're somebody that has not traditionally led your home and you step up and you say, you know what, I want to be a spiritual leader in my home, but man, uh, is my family going to, ex- are they going to accept that? You know, in my life, I've been so sinful. I have done so many wrong things. I could never be baptized. I could never come to Jesus. I could never join church. I could never stand up and lead my family at home because, because they're going to reject it. Because who I am is actually just kind of like this messed up person. And what happens when you give that authority over your life, that snare that you don't know is there, it's already got you. And when it's already got you, it begins to get all of you. And so you get your foot caught. So you get a little tiny part of your personality, a little tiny part of your life gets stuck in the snare. And you think, okay, no, it's okay. I can get out of this. I can get away from this. And the way a snare is designed is the more that the animal struggles, the more it stays stuck. So the more that you try and remove yourself from that little snare, the more that you get stuck and the more of you get stuck. And just like it works with an animal, a snare only has to get a little of your heart. It only has to get a little of your beliefs. It only has to get a little bit of your thoughts. Because when it captures the smallest bit of you, the smallest bit of how you think about yourself, the smallest bit of you that's afraid of rejection, once it's got that tiny little bit, guess what? The rest of you follows. And so Solomon, in all of his wisdom, he uses this word snare in relationship to fear of man, in relationship to rejection, because he sees it happen over and over and over again in people. And I think the intentionality behind him choosing that word snare is something that we can learn from. What is it in your life that you've let yourself be tricked into a trap, into a snare? Yeah, I really want to challenge you guys with this. Like I said in the beginning, some of the worst fears are the irrational fears. You know, it's easy to explain away a fear of, of spiders or a fear of heights. You know what's hard to explain away to people or even to explain to yourself is the fear that you carry about yourself, the rejection that you give yourself. See, many of us reject ourselves before we even give somebody else a chance to reject ourselves. Many of us deal with that within our own self. Hey, guess what? I do. And you know what? If that's you, that's Okay. Stop trying to avoid that. Stop stop trying to pretend that that doesn't exist. Stop struggling in your snare. Stop it. Believe in yourself. I I have a friend that I work out with during the week. And uh, he's a a trainer at Virgin Active. And he's an amazing man. God's name is David. And uh, I don't know if he's here today, but if he is, David, I love you. But I was talking with David this week, and I was just telling him I I was sick and, and as I was sick, you know, I had a sinus infection. I, I couldn't push as hard as I could push in the gym and, and lift the weights that I wanted to lift. And this, this snare in my life is so big. And, and the feeling of guilt and rejection in my life is so strong that I'm looking at David in the gym and I'm saying, David, I'm, man, I'm so sorry. I'm apologizing. I'm so sorry that I'm sick. I'm so sorry that I can't lift the weights. Man, I'm so hard on myself. I just feel like a failure. And David looks at me and he's like, if this is your thought pattern about the weight room, what is your thought pattern about life? And he says, Chris, there is only one thing and only one thing to claim in your life. And it is that you live in victory and the joy of the Lord is in you. And that's it. There is no anything else. And so I'm sitting on the weight bench, thankful that I'm sweating because I'm also crying. Because he, he spoke to my heart, he spoke to my soul. And guys, this snare 
This fear, this rejection that you feel in yourself, this self-doubt that you feel in yourself, this self-sabotage that you carry around within yourself, I just I want you to know that you're going to deal with this every day, every day, every day, every day. But guess what? Every single day you wake up with an opportunity to renew your thoughts and to renew your mind. And then that's when Solomon hits us with the next part of this verse, which is the best part of this verse. The first part is the wake-up call. And then the second part of the verse here is he goes on to say, but, and this word but means, but there is another option. But you don't have to stay in the snare. But you don't have to give in to those thoughts that you have. You don't have to, but there is another way. And it says, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. Amen, Amen right? But what does it actually mean to trust in the Lord? Because I say that I trust in the Lord, but then I, I, I doubt myself. I can say that I trust in God with my family and my finances, but I find myself stepping into snares over and over and over again. What this means here, to trust in the Lord, is that, is that God is my safety. And that every day when I wake up and every thought that I have, I have the opportunity to capture that thought and to instead say, you know what, with this thought, I trust in the Lord. Do I feel guilty today because I don't think I'm enough of a dad? Yes, I do. But you know what? I trust in the Lord and therefore I find safety. Do I feel shame about maybe my past and things that I've dealt with? You know what? I do, but I'm going to give that to God. I'm going to trust in God and I find safety in God. The point is, is that Solomon is telling you is that no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're going to go through, no matter how many broken down cars, no matter how much self-doubt that you feel, no matter how many things come against you and your family, no matter what happens with the business, you can take that and you can trust in the Lord. And out of that, there is a feeling of safety. Now, this feeling of safety, that's a hard one. That's a hard one to accept. It's a hard one to believe in. But here's what Jesus wants from you. Jesus wants this so badly for you. And this is so, when, when it's put this way, it's so simple. It's so simple that I've read it a million times this week because I want to claim it over my own life. And it's the step that Jesus is ultimately asking you to take. The step that Jesus is ultimately asking you to take, they'll put it on the screen here for you, is calling you to trust in him more than you fear mankind. Look how simple that is. Jesus just wants you. You don't have to get it right. You don't have to stop having self-doubt. You don't have to stop having bad days. You don't have to stop letting things impact you. You can let all that happen. And then when all of that happens to you, day in, day out, over and over and over again, all Jesus is asking you to do is to ultimately trust in Him more than you fear mankind. Trust in God more than you reject yourself. Trust in God more than you believe in yourself. See, this takes all the accountability off of you. You don't have to be strong enough to believe in yourself. You don't have to be strong enough to conquer guilt and shame. You don't have to be strong enough to heal from a broken relationship. You don't have to be strong enough to be confident when you enter into a room and you have social anxiety and you want to make a friend, but you're, not, you're too afraid to make a friend. You don't want to talk to people. You don't have to be strong enough for any of that. Guys... Jesus has given you permission to not be strong enough. Because it's not about you. It's about Jesus. And when you admit that you will never be strong enough, then instead, all you have to do is just trust in God. God, I'm terrified, but I trust you. God, I don't know how to believe in myself this week, but I trust you. God, I don't, I don't know, man, my family... Like we, we can't get the finances together. And man, as a husband, I feel like I should be giving my family more. I should be leading my family better in our, in our finances. I should be able to provide more for my kids. I should be able to, to do more. Man, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how I can just be proud when I enter into my own home. You know what? You don't have to. Because all you have to do is trust in Jesus more. You just have to trust in God. And when you do that, see... The remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you actually fear nothing else. Whereas when you do not fear God, then you fear everything else. And Josh, put that up here on the screen for people to see. 
The remarkable thing about God is that when we fear God, we fear nothing else. Whereas when you don't fear God, then you fear everything else. You know what kind of fear this is talking about? This fear of God is a, is a reverent awe of who God is. It's like, God, I, I don't understand you, but I accept that you are in charge of everything in this universe and everything in my life, and none of it makes any sense. Even the way I think and I believe about myself, none of it makes any sense at all. But you know what? I trust you. And I honor you. And I see you as the creator of, of everything around me. See, there is nothing, a truth that I hope all of you walk away with at some point in your life, is there is nothing that happens outside of the will and the control of God. God does not look at your life. And say, man, I'm so sorry that the car broke down. I'm so sorry that the kids are sick. I'm so sorry that you don't believe in yourself as a wife and as a mom. I'm so sorry that you don't have any friends. Man, I, I tried, but I just couldn't get it together for you. Man, I, hey, I wish that I could have given you another friend. That's not God. God's not saying, man, Chris, I tried to set your life up really well, but like Satan was just too strong. Or, Chris, I tried to bless you. I tried to, to give you freedom. I tried to give you love, but you just weren't good enough. Or you weren't smart enough to figure it out. See, God's not tricky. The role of God is not to trick you. The role of God is not to make it complicated or hard for you to come to Him. The role of God is to be God over your life and to fill you with His love and let His love then overflow out of you. And so this fear, the remarkable thing about God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. It's like saying the remarkable thing about God is that when I let God be God in my life, that means I don't have to do anything else. I just have to lean on God for that. So if you're tired of doing, if you're tired of overcoming, if you're tired of trying to figure it out yourself, if you're tired of trying to conquer the inner demons that you have, all you have to do is stop doing that. And I know it's oversimplification. Listen, I'm the king of anxiety and everything else. And I can tell you that there is truth in this. When I let God be God is when I find peace and I'm reminded of the safety that I walk in. And so I, I want to give you another encouraging statement. And it, it's this. I want you today to courageously respond to Jesus because he can break the pattern of fear in your life. No, no, it's, God, it's time to stop. It's time to stop the pattern of fear in your life. Because it repeats every day over and over and over. And can I just be honest and lead the way here and say that sometimes the pattern of fear in my life repeats like every 30 seconds in my head. Sometimes it repeats even more often than that. Sometimes it gets stuck and it never even goes off. So there's nothing to repeat because it's just a continuous thing. For the next eight days, I just live in stress and, and fear. And so if I'm able to stand up here and admit that and say that I need this as much as you guys do, then I hope that takes a little bit of pressure off you to let yourself be as messed up as you actually are and just claim it and step into it and own it and say, that's me, that's who I am. And I'm going to courageously respond to Jesus because I believe that he can break the pattern of fear in my life. And so we're going to practice that this morning. This morning is your morning to practice this. And I want to be realistic with you. So we're going to practice this with tw for, for 20 seconds. Today, we're going to practice 20 seconds of freedom. So I realize that it's an impossible ask for me to ask you, hey, just stop feeling guilty. Hey, just stop feeling rejected. Amen. Cool. You guys are going to walk out and your lives are cured Everything is done. Everything is simple. No, the second you sit in here and say, you know what? I'm going to believe in myself today. You're going to walk out there, and somebody in this building is going to walk up to you and say, you're looking kind of puffy. You're looking kind of chubby. And then it just all crumbles. <laughs> One of our staff members said that exact thing to me. Hey, Chris, you're looking puffy. And I was like, <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. I mean like, I mean like strong. I was like, it's done. It's done. It's done. You can't come back from this. It's, it's done. So I, I'm not going to ask you to do something unrealistic here. Instead, I want to ask you to do something that I, I do believe that you can do. 
I can't, I can't say that it's realistic for you to walk out of here and never feel or think a bad thing again and never deal with rejection again. Is God powerful enough to do that? Yes, He is. And if He does that for you, then amazing. Own it. Step into it and then tell somebody else about it. But what I can ask a lot of you to do, whether you believe in yourself or not, whether you believe in the healing power of God or not, whether you believe in the safety that comes with letting God be God, whether you believe in the power of you taking a courageous step towards God and letting Him do a remarkable act of freedom in your life, whether you believe it or not, I'm going to ask you to do it for 20 seconds. I'm going to ask you for 20 seconds to pretend What is it like if I don't feel guilt or shame? What is it like if I don't worry about rejection? What is it like if I'm not worried about how my friends perceive me or how my spouse perceives me or how the world accepts me? What's it like if I take all the things that are up here that I battle day in and day out? Am I good enough? Am I valuable enough? Can I accept myself? What if you take all that and for 20 seconds you just don't feel it? What if for 20 seconds you give it up? See, here's the truth, is that most of you are afraid to accept that. Most of you are afraid to give it up because you think that if I tell myself that I can take a step of freedom, that I can courageously let God impact my life, you're terrified to do that because you think if I say that I'll do that, I'm going to walk out these doors and Monday morning is going to happen and I'm going to fail and that means that all this meant nothing. And so again, if you risk nothing, you lose nothing. But guess what? If you don't do this, you're going to walk out of here with a regret. Because you're going to look back and you're going to say, what would it have been like for 20 seconds just to experience freedom and to experience a break from the rejection, the fear of man, the the things that are rolling around your inner demons, all of that. What, What would that feel like? Don't walk out of this room with regret today. Who cares what happens after this 20 seconds? I know what can happen, but who cares? Live in this moment. Live in this moment. Believe for this moment. Believe for the 20 seconds that you're going to have an opportunity for in your life. And so this is how it's going to work. We're not going to sit here awkwardly in silence for 20 seconds. I'm going to pray, and the band is going to come out. And they're going to lead us in, in a, a song, in a, a full worship song. And it may take you a minute to get into your 20 seconds. Or you may just jump into it right away. But I want you over the course of this song to take 20 seconds and give yourself the ability to feel freedom. So for 20 seconds, everyone in this room is going to walk in freedom. Don't worry about what happens after that. Just accept this right here because I believe if you can taste it then you'll go to it more and more and more 20 seconds becomes a minute a minute becomes an hour an hour becomes a day a day becomes a week a week becomes a lifestyle that that's where your freedom is your safety is in Jesus whether you fail or succeed your safety is in Jesus we're going to take 20 seconds and we're all going to practice and see what life feels like when we don't carry around that fear of rejection. Lord Jesus, I pray over this room. I pray that every single person in this room, everybody that...